You heard of this thing, the eight minute abs? Yeah, sure, eight minute abs. Yeah, the uh, exercise video. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, this is going to blow that right out of the water. Listen to this seven minute abs. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and should you look to kick those chumps you call friends to the curb? Is your network the key to your net worth? To help, we brought out our network, starting with the guy who you know as the retirement answer man, Roger Whitney. And one of the most networked people we know of from Afford Anything, Paula Pant. And lastly, a guy who's the center of any good network, our own OG. Plus, if you're looking to go from spender to saver, today on our Friday FinTech segment, we chat with the Chief Science Officer from Happy Money, Dr. Elizabeth Dunn. Don't worry, we'll still have time to magnify a lucky listener's money, and I'll spread some trivia joy from the happiest place on earth. And now, a guy who would drop everything to be part of your network, it's Joe Saul Seahai. Doesn't it sound a little creepy and overbearing? I'll be a part of your network. Can I be a part of your network? Hey, everybody. Welcome to Fridays with the overbearing guy who sits a little too close, even during the time of COVID. I'm Joe Salci. I average show money on Twitter. And the person who's socially distancing himself six feet across the table from me, it's Mr. OG. I socially distance from everyone all the time. <laughs> you totally do. You're like, social distance? Got this. Check. Yeah, that's that thing, uh, that meme about you've been you've been waiting your whole life for this. Like you've been training the entire time. Precisely. Yes. And from an undisclosed location, the woman who's decided that her cat is going to do the podcasting for her today, it's Paula Pant. Absolutely. Both me and my cat are at the microphone. So which one of us will speak first? Time will tell. <laughs> it is that, that we have to build a little bit of, uh, what is it when you just got a suspense? We got to build some suspense. Well, suspense. Yes. It's, yeah, will it be a human voice or will it be a meow? Who meow. knows? Oh, I can't wait. I'm going to wait an entire episode to hear. Will the cat talk? Yes. Uh, is your cat a good networker, Paula? No, she she's not very <laughs> no. sociable. This particular cat isn't, Azra. Azra is not very sociable. Typically when a new person arrives, she will uh, commence with hiding under the bed for a few days. You know what, Paula? Let's introduce to everyone the third member of today's triumvirate, the guy who is hiding under the bed, but we found him anyway. It's Mr. Roger Whitney here from the Rock Retirement Club. How are you, brother? Hey, oh, and my great Dane is sleeping here silently, waiting for me to take him for a walk. He's going to be waiting a while because we got a podcast to do, my friend. We got a podcast. They're pretty lazy dogs. He's okay. One walk a day and he's done. For people that are new to the show, they may not know that you are the retirement answer man. What's happening on the show? Oh, well, we just finished an entire series on Medicare. Oh, kind of exciting, <laughs> gripping topics that we discuss. And this month, though, in October, we are talking about unexpected retirements, whether it's forced upon you because of the COVID disruption or whether you get a package that's just too good to be true. How do you navigate an accelerated journey? That's what we're talking about. I thought after Medicare, you were going to go for something really scintillating, like uh, what factor do you do when calculating an immediate annuity now the interest <laughs> rates are low? <laughs> Am I spoiling like what's coming up in December? I will tell you, in the Rock Retirement Club, we have a contingent. It's called the Spreadsheet Geek Group. And there are people that are wired that just love those types of discussions and I am blessed that have them in my life, but not be one. That is totally, that is totally me. Well, I'm glad you're here with us. We got Roger, we got Paula, we got OG. We're going to talk about networking today. How do you grow your network? We've got lots of thoughts. So let's get the party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Today, we're talking about a piece from the Young Finances blog. Our friend uh, Letitia Stiles created this piece, 
uh, networking though, not just for young people. And the piece talks a lot about building your network and who you should build your network with. It's super interesting. And, and Roger, let's start with you. This piece starts off by saying that you should build, first of all, a network with a recruiter to always know somebody so that you can maybe change jobs, look for higher income, look to maybe advance up the corporate ladder. You think that's uh, network person number one? Oh, I don't know if it's number one or not, but I do think it's good to have on the list. My motto is walk with the wise and become wise. I think even before you get to the subcategories is define the kind of people you want to have in your ecosystem of life, your network of really quality people that are critical thinkers, obviously have a great spirit and a servant heart and all, all those other things. And yeah, I think a networker should be one of those or a recruiter should be one of those. Should you be working on your LinkedIn profile first thing? I mean, does that job one, does that help you then build your network by having a better LinkedIn profile? I think it does help you having something robust on your LinkedIn because that's where people initiate the connection, but it's pretty superficial there, isn't it? A story about that. I have a client, great friend of mine. He's a gentleman that went to Mongolia with me a few years back. He is very fanatical about nurturing his network. And he literally makes 10 plus birthday calls a day and more emails for different people. He leaves his work about every five years. He quits. And he's a C-level executive. And I, I, talked to, I talked about him in my book as well. Never lacks for a job. He always gets opportunities brought to him because his, he keeps such a vibrant network of professionals that are just good people that he loves. And so he never lacks for opportunities because he's so intentional on how he networks. So I think it's definitely important to do that. And I think recruiters should be part of that. When you're saying that he quits, he quits the job that he's working and just goes and does something else? Well, his plan is he takes retirement every five years for a couple of years. And he does it around his children growing up. But does he and go the, back to, does he go back to the same job or does he go find a different thing? He finds a different thing. Finds well, a different they thing. find him. Yeah. They find him. It's one of the most unique things I've seen, but I've learned so much from him on how he cultivates a network. And with him, it's truly a love of people. And I think that's one thing you have to have if you're going to do it, because you want to be strategic about it, sure. But he networks and he'll call the lady who was who worked at the Marriott that he would travel to every week for work. He calls her on her birthday, just like he calls the CEO of some big company. Uh, and I think that's the kind of spirit you want to have if you're really going to do it successfully. That's crazy. Paula, have you called the person working at every hotel you stayed at to wish them a happy birthday? I'm a millennial. I don't make calls. You send texts. <laughs> what is this call thing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you're telling me that device I have can make voice calls? <laughs> I, I, the device that's in my pocket? It's funny you say that because uh, Bobby Rebel, my co-host at Money with Friends, always talks about taping an episode. I'm like, let's try not to be that old. Let's try not to tape. And there is no tape anymore, Bobby. And not that she's old, but I'm old. But I'm like, let's just record one. That would be great. Yeah. Uh, I've often had that thought about the expression like caught on tape. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. You're like, what? what is that? Yeah. That's, that's all gone. But seriously, uh, wishing people happy birthdays, that a big part of your uh, recognizing other people's achievements? No, not really. I mean, I, if I know that it's a friend's birthday, I'll send him a text because that's what millennials do. We tem and Gen Z, we text. If somebody called me out of the blue, I'd be so weirded out. Like, so I'd be like, mom, why are you calling me? <laughs> but that's not a good thing. Like I remember, and I think Roger, you and I talked about this at one point. We're in an age where nobody sends written letters anymore. And to get a written thing saying thank you for, from somebody is so powerful now because nobody does it. So are we at that point now where calling is that special thing? Like, I'm really thinking about you, Paula, if I call you. I have on that written note real quick. I have hard stock cards that have that are very nicely created. I send them every week and I write a sharp I write right sharpie on it and I write their name in red and then something personal about them and then the sentiment I want to send and then I sign it. And I was t speaking to a lady who was the head of a CPA association in Texas where I've I've taught a lot of continuing education 
a year and a half later, we were having a conversation. And he says, you know, I still have that card on my pin board in my office because I just can't throw it away. And I think that's how you successfully network. Well, she feels guilty about the tree that you're, you just got rid of. <laughs> there it is. I'm, I'm, a, I'm almost a boomer. I don't care about anything. <laughs> oh, gee, how about you? Recruiter first on your list, LinkedIn profile? Uh, I'm with Roger. I don't know that this is the, the first thing on the list, um, but I do think that you've got to take the time, especially early on, to make sure that you're, if you're going to do something like LinkedIn, if you're going to focus on it, that it's not just a, 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 a snapshot of your resume that is formatted in the form of a resume. I think you got to tell the story because people want to hear the story about you as they're trying to connect with you or as they're trying to figure out where you might fit or, or, or whatever, if you're thinking about it from a job perspective. And I think that was one of the things that I got a while ago in LinkedIn was that you could tell the difference between the people who actually gave a crap and like went in there every so often and, you know, made some updates and, you know, that sort of thing. And the people that like literally slapped in, went to college, got this job, worked for this period of time. You know, the picture is seven or 10 years old. If you're going to use something, you got to use it. You know, like Roger's cards, you know, if you're going to call your clients on their birthdays, you got to call your clients on your birthday. You can't miss one. You can't start and then and then stop. If you're going to send yeah. holiday cards, you send holiday cards to everyone all the time. You know, and whatever your whatever your connecting tool is going to be, it has to be something that you can do repeatedly time after time. Back when I was doing PR for American Express, I had to go to this stupid expensive place, especially for the little hair that I have to get my hair cut. Not that it had to look good because there's no way to make this. It just couldn't look bad. You couldn't have one hair out of place. So they said, you got to go to this place. But anyway, they had a coffee bar, this wild, you know, there's part of the five bajillion dollars you paid to get your, your, your hair cut was this coffee bar. And they, they asked me if I wanted a cappuccino or an espresso. And I thought this is really cool. And to your point, OG, they did that the first time, the second time I sat down and nobody did it. And I was pretty upset. Which is actually yeah. funny because if they'd never done it in the first place, like they do, should I get upset about them not offering me an espresso when I go to get my hair cut? But once they did it the first time, they set precedent, and then I was I was peeved. It's like that comedy bit with uh, I don't remember who it was, but they're talking about the being on the airplane the first time Wi-Fi was offered. You know, they announced it at the plane and like, hey, we're gonna have Wi-Fi for the first time ever, and then ten minutes into it, it went down. And, and, you know, so they came back on and said, Hey, sorry, you know, something screwed up. Well, you know, we apologize. And the comedian said that the guy next to him was like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> How am I supposed to get any work done? It's like, you didn't have Wi-Fi 10 minutes ago. You didn't even know it was a thing on an airplane and now you're mad at the world. So yeah, you gotta be careful with that. That is crazy. Part of what, you know, it's funny. I pulled up this uh, piece from the Harvard Business Review talking about how successful people network with each other. And one of the first things on the author's list here is successful people are only going to be attracted to you if you're somebody with an interesting story to tell. There are a lot of different people out there and you have to be somebody who's interesting. So the first thing is to identify what sets you apart. Are those the people, Paula, that you're attracted to when you network? People that maybe have some thing that sets them apart from everybody else? I mean, it depends. If you know that someone is like milking it and they're, they're trying to figure out like, what's my shtick? And, and it comes off as a little, I'm wearing a vinyl suit, cheesy kind of a thing. Uh, that's just a turn off. Are you right? saying you don't like my vinyl suit? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> Have they ever even I mean, made Leon a vinyl Orange suit? I, I'm trying to decide what a vinyl suit is. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what maybe... Uh, Eddie Murphy had on in Raw. I don't know if that's Maybe a that like red uh, <laughs> flashy thing, yeah. Part of what creates a story is, is human emotion. Like people connect when we can, pe people connect at an emotional level, particularly through the medium of storytelling. So those universal, like f the feeling of rejection or embarrassment or pride or triumph, even if the details of the story are mundane, it's the, that emotion, uh, the more relatable it is, the more that that connects. And that is, I think, much more compelling, particularly if it's delivered in a way that doesn't seem to be name droppy or um, uh, what's the word for um, humble braggy? 
But if I'm trying to meet somebody for the first time, I really want to meet them. They're a successful person. I want to network with them. How do I get time then, Roger, to tell them the story? Well, it, I don't know if you want to tell them a story. I think you want to make a friend is really what you want to do. And I think if you're going to build a network, and I see this all the time with younger advisors that will email, email me asking me about the podcast or something else. Generally, I'm willing to have a you know, 10, 15 minute conversation to make a friend. And then that's when you really find out if somebody is truly curious. Just reach out or, in a human way, you're saying. Yeah, and be in focus on it that way rather than having an agenda necessarily. If, if, if you're younger and you're trying to build your networks, I would suggest that you really, when you find someone, whether it's on a podcast or something that you read that's a book, is to reach out to them and be very specific about what it was that they had that resonated with you. And then don't be afraid to ask, would you be willing to you know, chat with me to and be specific about what you want? Better to build networks up front. Most people are more accessible than you think they are if they if you phrase it in the right way. I've always found that very difficult to do, though, OG, what Roger's saying, just reaching out to somebody who I admire and saying, hey, I, 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 I don't know if it's the giving compliments part or the, the, the just, hey, I'm interested in your stuff or I don't know what it is. It is definitely very difficult for you to give compliments. That's for sure. <laughs> having, having worked with you for a decade, I can assure you that that is a skill that you have not yet mastered. I, I think you're wrong there. He has no problem in complimenting himself. <laughs> there you go. Yes. I'm absolutely. sitting right here, guys. I'm sitting right here. Yeah, I'm kind of like you. I don't know that I would pick up the phone and just randomly call someone with an ask. You know, like... I don't know that uh, I'm, I'm kind of the same way. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it, but just the, Hey, I like the thing that you did and I wanted to talk to you about it. <laughs> I feel like, but don't you think that's the right thing to do? Like if you're trying to network, clearly doing that ask is the right thing to do. I think that you want to be a connector. I think that you want to help people solve problems. Roger said to be friends and that's true too. You want to be the person that is the person that people call when they have problems that they need solved. Whether, whether it's a problem that's associated with, with your business and you happen to be an expert in it, you know, like Roger or me, financial planning, or if your problem is something unrelated, but you know that Roger can find somebody to help you or point you in the right direction or at least give you some wise counsel about how to think about the problem that you're having. You know, we were talking a little bit offline about the entrepreneur coaching group that we all belong to, except Paula called uh, strategic coach. No pressure, Paula, but uh, I'm going to have my people call your people and you can join. That's right. And but, you know, we're going to, we're going to start drawing circles. And they're not shy about asking, by the way. Yeah. yeah so, it, so, cause here's the deal. If OG and I get two more people in strategic coach, then we no longer have to go. And then they get two people in strategic coach. Yeah, we all get a set of steak knives. But one of the things that is really important about strategic coach or kind of a, a principle there is it's not about the problem. It's how you think about the problem. You know, it's just the thinking about the thinking that really matters. And if you can be part of the people or part of the group of people that other people will look to to help think about the problems, I think you've got a good chance of of kind of always being in the conversation, no matter what that conversation is about. It's interesting you say that, OG, because the next thing on this Harvard Business Review list was to become a connoisseur of something to have this deep knowledge of something. And it doesn't have to be your main topic. I mean, for us, we're all here because to some degree, we're all money geeks, right? And we have that in common. However, at the same time, uh, Roger and I play board games together. OG and I have geeked out about 50 million things. I was going to say, I'm a connoisseur of bourbon and red wine. <laughs> <laughs> That's, Wine was the first thing that popped into my mind, too. <laughs> uh, Paul, uh, Paul and I have all that Star Wars history together. Yeah. <laughs> so we all, have, we all have these things. But it's, it's interesting because they talk about Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, who most people know are buddies. And they could talk a lot of things about business, but it actually is their expert level seriousness about the card game Bridge which if you've ever heard the two of them talk about bridge together, those guys go deep on talking about this, this card game. What do you think about this idea of networking with people through something you're a connoisseur of, Paula? I mean, if it's authentic, if you have a genuine interest in playing bridge or tennis or whatever, whatever hobby it is that you have, whatever interest it is that you have, Sure, if you happen to meet somebody who shares that same interest, of course you can talk about it. But I think 
embracing these as strategic tips, it ends up being inauthentic and people can smell inauthenticity from a mile away. So are you saying though that you can't, you can't be strategic and authentic at the same time? Well, I don't think that you can, with, in the context of being a connoisseur of something, I don't think that you can decide, hey, it would be advantageous to develop a passion for golf and then try to really get into it. I mean, it might be that you've had zero exposure to the world of golf, and once you get into it, you end up naturally liking it. That's different. But you can't, like, robotically decide, like, all factors point to golf, must learn basics of conversational fluency in said sport. Like hypothetically loving, uh, pretending you love board games. So you make a lot of friends. <laughs> is, is, is that your strategy? John? Cause all the cool, I'm not talking about me. I would never talk about me. Uh, hi hypothetically, it's pretending to have an interest in the British Royal family. <laughs> right. so that you can talk to everyone about yes. Kate Middleton, Meghan Markle gossip. <laughs> I want to ask about where people hang out, because I remember reading Dr. Thomas Stanley not only has the great book, The Millionaire Next Door, but he also has books for financial advisors and for people that manage money about finding millionaires. And he talks about going where those people are, fishing where the fish are, right? And a lot of times you find that people don't think about that with their network. They're hanging out with the wrong group of people in one of these pieces that I read. This is from uh, entrepreneur.com. One of the top five ways it says to connect and network with other entrepreneurs is to be active on Twitter and to join an entrepreneurial organization. Do you find that having chats online with people helps build your network and joining the professional organization, Roger, helps? I don't know if it hurts. I've been a horrible network all, all my life. so Which is why we chose for you for this show. Exactly. I mean, I do believe you want to intentionally network with people that you want to emulate in some way. Joe, that's one reason we don't hang out anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm just boom. getting beat up today. I'm on a roll today, aren't I? <laughs> no, and, and for me, like professionally, what has become my networking is my podcast. I'm a connoisseur of how do you not just survive life after work, but how do you actually rock retirement? And all I do is talk about that and think about it. And it's very authentic. And I have made friends all over the world, advisors and people like you, but also lots of listeners through the years, just because they resonate and they, they re they're my people and I'm their people. You're so for so me, that's been my vehicle. But beyond that, I was horrible. Well, you're somebody who gave up. In fact, as I think about you, you're somebody that gave up a lot of your social media. You turned it off. You got rid of your Facebook for a while, which I thought as you were doing that, I'm like, is he nuts? Did that affect your networking? Not at all. I think my life has been better. It didn't affect it at all because all my network. Now, I will say locally, I, I joke with my wife. It's like, I have no friends that live within 20 miles of me. I have you that live everywhere. OG lives fairly close. I have friends all over the world, but nobody locally. I just can't believe your life is better without Facebook. That's, 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 that's shocking. <laughs> it's hard to believe. Uh, it also said, by the way, speaking of no friends locally, Roger, and this is important. Another piece about networking, networking locally said to organize a local meetup you know, once we're past this COVID thing, it, like if it doesn't exist, organize it yourself and become the center of your network. What do you think about that one, Paula? I love that. I absolutely love that. One of the best ways to, to meet people is to meet them face to face. You develop a certain connection with someone when you're in the same room with them. Actually, Letitia, who wrote the, the first article that we discussed, she's a very good friend of mine. I, I was a bridesmaid in her wedding. That's because like we met through the local FinCon Facebook group in Atlanta. And that friendship became close because we lived in the same city. We, we were in the same room together at the same time. And that's a different type of getting to know someone than simply just knowing them online only. Oh, gee, that's why you and I have loved having meetups around the country because getting to know listeners makes it not just us sitting here with microphones chatting at oh. each other. Yeah. This year has been particularly difficult for obvious reasons, but it does feel like it's something that's missing. Let's talk about takeaways, guys, here. If somebody's trying to build their network, Roger, we'll have, uh, you're the guest of honor, so you'll get the last word. Let's start with Paula. Paula, your best networking tip? 
make friends. Think of networking as simply being yourself and going out there and making some friends. Make new friends, but keep the old. One is silver and the other one's gold. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I just came up with that. OG? I would say always, always say yes. You know, if somebody wants to invite you out for dinner or ask you to come over and play games with them, even though it's probably not your favorite thing to do in the world and you got to drive three hours to do it, you just say, yeah, sure. That is oddly specific. So oddly flipping specific. Roger, you got the last word, my friend. Well, I think this tags on at the end of the process of make friends, always say yes and be open is to have some framework of playing the long game to nurture that friendship rather than being inauthentic and looking for a sale or a connection. Nurture the friendship over time. Well, I get super excited when we start talking about happy money because... One of my favorite authors, Ken Honda, had a book called Happy Money. We're not going to be talking about that today. We're going to talk about a website called Happy Money. Welcome to the Friday FinTech segment. This is where we dive into cool things on your computer that we found. We don't know a lot about them. We're going to discover them alongside you. So today we're talking to Dr. Elizabeth Dunn, who is known worldwide for expertise on happiness and money. It's interesting to see a money website combining with somebody who thinks about behavior and about happiness. And of course, we all want to be more happy and getting our financial picture in order is a big piece of that. So let's say hello to Dr. Elizabeth Dunn and talk some happy money. And on my dad's shortwave radio from happy money, it's Dr. Elizabeth Dunn. Elizabeth, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm so glad that you could be with us. I love the name Happy Money. It just makes me think such good things. But when I was visiting your website, you draw a clear distinction between happy money and I think the way things are for most people, which is sad money. Can we talk about sad money first, if that's all right? Yeah. So the ultimate sad money, I think, is the money that people pour into paying off their credit card debt. In fact, we have data on this. We see that people are really pretty miserable when they're paying, you know, debt or paying off debt or paying off bank fees. There's just a whole lot of sad money rolling around the system. And we're trying to change that. Well, and it's frustrating, as you know, I mean, you're working with people all the time that are in debt. It's very frustrating because you feel like you get it half paid down and then something else comes up and it feels like this miserable thing that you can't get out of. How did you guys decide you'd be able to help people get to the happy money state? Well, you know, debt tends to be like a revolving door where people just kind of get back, start to get out and then end up right back in. And the interesting thing is that the financial system is sort of built to encourage that revolving door because companies can make money off of people by keeping them in debt. And so I think our key insight was, you know what, we don't want to do that. We, that's just, we want to run things a bit differently. We want to actually help people get out of debt and not just get out of debt, but start to save. So turn borrowers into savers is really our core mission. Wow. And how does that work? Walk me through how happy money works then. Yeah. So the basic idea is that of course we first want to help people get out of debt And then to help them sort of figure out a personalized system that's going to work for them to start thinking about their money in really a fundamentally different way. So in particular, you know, my focus as being a happiness researcher, you know, you don't usually find a happiness researcher working for a tech fintech company. That was my next question, Elizabeth. So I'm glad that you that you said that because I'm like, this is a really cool marriage, but I don't see this often. Yeah, it's a weird marriage, right? It's unusual, um, but it reflects the very different take that this company has. So um, the idea is that like, let's, okay, let's stop and think about what kinds of expenditures are really making you happy. And then, you know, go ahead and enjoy those. And then what can we cut? Like what kinds of spending is not serving you, is not actually making you happy. And so by trying to cut back on some of those expenditures, we can potentially create new room for savings. And we're also applying 
some of the best insights from behavioral science to help people figure out how they can get out of debt, stay out of debt, and actually start to save money as well. Well, and I'd love to hear to detour for just a second in in your research. When you talk about those types of things that make people happy, are there some... I hate rules of thumb. I'm sure you probably hate rules of thumb, but are there just generally some things that make people happy and other things that we think make us happy, but really don't? Yeah. So I've done about a decade of research on this to try to figure out some sort of core principles that people can use as starting points. And, and you know, it's not a recipe book. It's more like a few key ingredients to kind yeah. of keep in, mind in making your own kind of happiness recipe. One of these principles is that it is better to buy experiences than to buy material things. So people seem to get more happiness and more lasting happiness from buying things like um, vacations, special meals, concerts, than from buying material things like, you know, fancy shoes or gadgets. We went to the Canadian Rockies a year ago And it's funny because at the time, Banff, Lake Louise and Jasper were pretty nice places. But here a year later, I feel like those experiences have appreciated, right? They're even more epic today than they were a year ago. Yet I'm sure that the souvenirs that I bought while I was there, I don't even hardly think about anymore. Yeah, and that's exactly what the research shows, that these experiential purchases, um, their emotional value actually seems to grow over time. It's like we get this return on investment from buying experiences. So how do you use that research then to fundamentally help people change their view to think less about things that they want to buy and more about how to make their life, I, I don't know, more epic or do more things? Well, so one way is by just helping people reframe their spending decisions to think about what actually is making them happy. So we know from, you know, like I said, about a decade of research that buying experiences seems to provide more happiness than buying material things on average. But that's not actually true for every single individual. So one thing that we're trying to work toward is being able to provide people with more personalized input on what will actually make them happy and also just give them this sort of space to reflect on this for themselves and then consider, you know, is this purchase something that's actually contributing to my happiness? Is that, you know, $5 latte that I buy every day? Is that something that is actually a a moment of joy in my day that I look forward to and really appreciate? If so, have at it. You know, we're not saying you have to skimp on everything, right? But if it's just something you started taking for granted, something you kind of suck down because that's just what you do did yesterday and what you'll do tomorrow. So it's what you're going to do today. Then maybe that's room where, Hey, that's five bucks that could actually go into your, you know, your savings account and help you build up that sort of pattern of savings. And one thing we know is that building up these small habits can actually make a really big difference over time. Well, I want to talk about two things. Number one, I want to talk about just generally how happy money works. Then if we dive into, if I go to happymoney.com, and then I want to talk about a course you guys are offering right now called Peace. But first of all, just if I go to happymoney.com, how does somebody work with happy money to maybe get their debt under control and take control of their money? Yeah, so we have a whole sort of financial ecosystem that people can take advantage of. And so there isn't just sort of one pathway that people have to take. But, you know, I think one of the first key steps is to try to break up with your credit cards. That's really one thing that we encourage people to start with and then move toward building up their savings. And we're sort of there at every step of the way, harnessing behavioral science, harnessing this really customer focused approach in trying to actually get people out of this revolving door of debt rather than keeping them in it. And so we're going to personalize that approach and what what that pathway is going to look like will depend on the needs of the individual. Do I interact with you via an app? Is it, uh, do we have meetings that we go to? How how, How does it work where you're personalizing it for me individually? Yeah, so it depends on the support that people need. And we have a constantly evolving ecosystem of products. Um, But we do have real people that you can talk to and who are there to, again, give you a personalized experience and help figure out what you um, need as an individual. Again, we don't want to just treat people as though they're, you know, everybody has the same needs. I think for too long, we've assumed that the financial services customer looks one particular way. Right. We're not so interested in that one size fits all kind of approach. Um, and we're here for a more, a more personalized kind of style. Or even if you know that they don't, that they all go through the same funnel, right? I mean, everybody just funnels down the same thing, but there is a thing that I find really cool called peace that you guys are offering right now. It's open currently. Talk to me about peace and what that's all about. 
I am so excited about this program. This was one of my big summer projects, was working with a team of scientists to develop an evidence-based program to help people reduce their levels of stress and financial stress in particular. And in fact, even if you're not a member of Happy Money, you can get access to this program because we've decided to make it freely available to everybody. And it's designed for people who are busy. So I wanted this program to be something that anybody could do in about 10 minutes a day. And so what we did was to try to take the sort of best, most well-supported approaches for helping reduce stress and create, turn those into approachable nuggets that everyone can use kind of anywhere, whatever they're doing. Each week, people work on one particular skill, which we sometimes call a superpower, where they learn, for example, um, in week one, they learn about progressive muscle relaxation, which teaches you a super valuable skill, teaches you how to basically relax every muscle in your body in this way that's like pretty amazing, in my opinion. I've, I've done this, and tell me if this is the same thing. This is a technique that I've tried to use to fall asleep on a plane. When I'm traveling, I have a hell of a time sleeping on a plane. But when we do these trips like to Europe, it is brutal if I don't get some sleep. Is, is it similar to that? Is it a similar exercise? Yeah. So that sounds like you've done something at least very similar to this progressive muscle relaxation exercise. And like you said, once you have this skill, it's something that you can use anywhere. So you could use it on a plane, you could use it on a you know, bus where you're wearing a mask and maybe you're not super comfortable and you're squeezed in. You've got this exercise that you can do. And so we've designed these as audio exercises that people can complete, again, wherever they are, develop this skill, and then use it when they need it. That's really cool because uh, I can just imagine. I never imagined applying something like that to debt, but I do remember, man, when I had lots of debt back in the early 90s, I was a ball of stress. Like I was a complete ball of stress. And using that technique or a similar technique to what I do on planes, I think would be fantastic. Kind of puts me in the moment and out of this, a lot of the stuff I can't control and puts me back in control. What other sorts of things are you going to teach people in peace? Yeah. So in week two, they move into challenging negative thoughts. So this is an exercise that can help people replace those negative thoughts that kind of drag you down with more helpful, more balanced ones. Doesn't mean we're trying to turn anyone into like Pollyanna, everything sunshine and ice cream all the time. It's just a way of helping you kind of challenge some of those overly negative thoughts that a lot of us drag around with us and can kind of bring us down. But I would imagine as a happiness expert and researcher, Elizabeth, there must be so much research around you are what you think about. Exactly. And so we have a lot more control over our own happiness than many people realize. So happiness, it turns out, isn't really about what happens to us. It's about the way we think about those things, right? So we can change a lot of our feelings if we, again, but it's not magic, right? It's not something that you can just decide one day, you know what, I'm going to think differently about stuff, right? And then it's going to happen. You need to have, it's a skill that you need to build, right? It's kind of like going to the gym or something. You need to build up these muscles and we know how to do it. And so that's what we're trying to do is deliver this to people in a way that's really easy, accessible, and, and pretty fast for them to develop. But that's also why it's daily. And, and how long is it for, for six weeks? It's over six weeks total. And so each week we're kind of giving people this new skill. So a week is sort of enough time to learn this skill. You're just practicing it for a few minutes a day. And so by the end of the program, we actually get to the more happiness focused side of things. So we start by just trying to get people's stress a little bit under control. Yeah. And by the end of the program, we're actually trying to teach them how to build out their positive emotions. Um, so in the last week of the, the program, we have them work on savoring small pleasures. Um, so having learned to cope with their negative feelings, now they get a chance to kind of practice enhancing more positive emotions by focusing on some of life's little pleasures. So that's sort of like the dessert that comes at the end. Um, after you've had your peas and carrots, you get a chance to really play up these positive <laughs> emotions, ice cream, psychological ice cream, I guess I would call it. <laughs> Don't say that because I'm hungry right now. So that's, that's horrible. Uh, the site is called Happy Money. And to get to to get to peace, which is open right now, it's happymoney.com forward slash peace. That's correct. Awesome. Dr. Elizabeth Dunn, thanks for spending time with us today talking about turning sad money into happy money. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Hey, trivia fans. On the center of your network, your pal, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. 
All this talk about network has me thinking. While you can tell by my big money El Camino and these Converse shoes that I'm clearly doing well with my money, hashtag Doug2020, but I couldn't listen to that discussion and not think, could I 10x my funds if I swapped out some of the slackers in my life for some big time winners? I'll ask you your opinion on my network in just a bit. But first, let's pay it forward by gifting you today's trivia. On this date in history, the Walt Disney Corporation was founded, which means that because Joe's here, I'm probably contractually obligated to do trivia about the company, right? So the question is this, what year was this basement favorite moneymaker officially launched? We'll be back faster than you can wish upon a star that you knew the answer. Of course, on this very important day in history, we had to have some Disney trivia. Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, for those of you who are new to this game, we are playing a year-long competition between OG, Paula, and Len. Roger, you'll be playing on behalf of the Len Penzo. And there's good news, bad news there, Roger. The good news is you are in first place with 14 points playing for Len. But the bad news is that means that you're going to have to go last. Paula has 13 OG now falling behind at 11, but the good news OG for you, that means you get to decide first. Would you like to guess first in the middle or last when the Walt Disney company was created? Uh, we're going to go last. Huh? Paula. I will guess in the middle. And so Roger, you're kicking this thing off. Then the Walt Disney corporation, when was it created? First, I'd like to apologize for Len because I have a horrible track record as a stand-in. So please forgive me. You apologizing for Len or to Len? Because there's a difference there. Because <laughs> we've many all, people apologize for right. Len. <laughs> I will directly to you. And if you're apologizing for him, it's probably nicer if he's here. But uh, anyway, so what year was Walt Disney Corporation founded? Yes, created. 1923. 1923. That's oddly specific dart that you're throwing. Not 1920. The black and white of Mickey in my head that made me think it must be. Was that a talkie? Did, was there were the first Mickey Mouse's silent films? I think they had music. They had those merry mel medleys that had yeah, music. I'm going 1923. I feel good about that. Okay, Paula. This is hard. Oh, man. All right. I want a guess. I need to leave some distance. Strategically, I need to leave some distance between my guess and Roger's guess. But I can't leave too much distance. Why do you think it's in that ballpark? I do. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's pretty close. Okay, I'm going to go with 1930. Usually you tell us all the machinery going on in that head, Paula. I just, if I leave too much distance. Oh, it has no, it's more I, strategic about the game. It's not what year did Walt Disney do anything? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how to not get totally Chelsea Brennan. Um, you know what? Can I go with 1931, final answer? Okay, that's fine. Yes, okay. 1931. All right, OG. What did Google so, say, OG? So 1923 or 1931, huh? So I feel as though so when did Walt when did the Walt Disney Company when was it founded that is the question that's correct i have a stock of walt disney on my wall i can't read any of it the guy looks pretty old in the picture i'll be honest <laughs> whether or not he's 90 or 95 is the question i guess right 95 or 100 uh so i think it was before 31 but after 23 so where where would i go to have the best chance of success uh paula gave me an even number of eight so i could go 27 and that gives me equidistant what do we do in case of a tie <laughs> tie goes to the special guest i do believe <laughs> oh that's the rule okay i'm gonna say um i'm gonna just split the difference and say 19 I can't split the difference. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say 1927, right in the middle. Oh, if we end up with a tie, I don't know what we're going to do. Like, how is this going to work? We'll let you know if we have a tie here in just a couple minutes. Well, today, because we need so much flexibility, if you have a business, you need to be able to work from anywhere. Business owners and workers, you're always on the go now. 
and often means using your cell phone for business purposes. And by on the go, I mean, you're anywhere but work, right? Nobody's in the office anymore. You're probably at home and you might be in a different room of your house, but your office is probably sat empty for the last few months. So whether you're a small business owner, an entrepreneur, or having to adjust to today's changing lifestyles, phone.com is for you. Phone.com provides you with business phone numbers. You can connect to any device. You can also have video meetings and conferencing, no more regular hassle in setting up video calls. And, and this is a big one, phone.com voice and video solutions. They're certified HIPAA compliant. Remember that company that had the yeah, it's not as private as uh, you may think it is. Problem, phone.com, voice and video, certified HIPAA compliant. Visit phone.com and check out how easy it is. No difficult hardware to install. You just pick a monthly plan, a new number, or use the one you already have. So whether you're an entrepreneur, a company of one, or a team of 20, phone.com is for you. And as your business grows, they grow with you. 24-7 customer support with live humans, greetings, automated attendance, hold music, Call forwarding, screening, incoming caller ID. Go online at phone.com. You can be making calls in minutes. That's P-H-O-N-E dot com. Or you can call them at 877-PHONE-10. And by the way, for stackers, you're going to use promo code stacker and you're going to get 20% off your first three months. Again, that's phone.com or call 877-PHONE-10, promo code stacker. Check them out at phone.com. See how they can help you. You're probably used to scrolling through social media, catching headlines in bits and pieces. Don't people call that uh, the scroll of death, by the way? It might be a good way to follow the chatter and kill a few hours, but you need a better way to understand the news. And that's why NPR has a new daily podcast called Consider This. We don't just catch you up on what's happening. We help you make sense of the day because once things make sense, you can get off your phone and go for a walk or something. Listen to Consider This from NPR every day. Roger, you kicked it off with 1923. They all went later than you. Worried about that? I am solid, man. Maybe you're a little I'm early. Solid. Could be a little early. Well, you know. Who knows? Paula, 1931, did you give yourself enough room? Well, I mean, I have all of the room on the upside. So if it was founded in like 2002, I'm good. Which it totally was. I'm sure seeing that I went to Disney for the first time in like 1978, but the company wasn't funny. Wouldn't that be wild if it were a technicality question and, and they changed names, something? Exactly, exactly. Doug, Doug could do that. He's done that before. Oh, gee, how about you? Right in the middle. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Well, Doug knows. Doug, what's the answer to today's question? Hey, trivia pals. I'm your well-networked guy, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And maybe you can help me improve my network. I think we can all agree that besides Joe's mom, there's no hope networking with these guys or that lazy cat, Cooper. Such a putz. Every Tuesday, I chat with the trash guy, Ted. You can tell he's got an opinion because whenever I ask him anything, he says, recycling? Brilliant. I've been spending more time with the Sizzler's new assistant manager, Todd. Well, we all know what that guy's done to the Sizzler lately. The neighborhood kids are horrible at putting baseball cards into their bike spokes, so I doubt they have any great advice on business, even though I gotta say, Jacob knows some filthy jokes. That kid's gotta clean up his mouth. Give me your opinion. Besides Ted and Jacob, is it time for me to move on? I'll think on this a little bit more, but here's today's trivia answer. I mentioned that on this date in history, the Walt Disney Corporation was founded. Today's question was, what was the year? It turns out that the Walt Disney Corporation is just about to hit its 100th birthday as it was founded all the way back in 1923. Bam! Bullseye, baby! Whoa! Holy cow! I, I freaking knew that, too, because of the D23 group. You know, the little... D23, you're right. I get the stupid I magazines. Total guess. What an <laughs> Total hole. guess. Yes, the inside. I didn't even think about that, OG. Yeah. The, <laughs> I'm like, after you started talking, I was thinking about it. I go, it's 23. It has to be. That's what the D, that's the 23 and D23 stands for. Paula's excited about this one. She just yawned. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked. She like, didn't realize I was that smart, Joe. Roger, I right really on did. it. Were you thinking D23? Is that what you were thinking? I don't even know what that is. 
It's Disney a group of Disney here. nerds, and it's like this insider group of Disney nerds. Yeah, it's, that, like their, it's their club. Well, it's their club, their big club. I am friends with Lou Mangello, so maybe from osmosis I absorb some of that. That's fantastic, Roger. Well, Len's going to be very happy with you today. You're welcome. Very happy. Hey, before Roger starts gloating too much, let's take out the magnifying glass and help somebody do better with their money. Today's hotline call comes to us courtesy of magnifymoney.com. Roger, when you go to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, you know what happens? I get a virus. <laughs> <laughs> the sponsor loves it when you say that. <laughs> don't, don't, go, don't go to magnify money because you'll get a virus. Yeah. No, Brian, I do not know what happens, actually. Please I can see me. Brian at Magnify Money calling me going, that Whitney guy can't come back. We gotta, That's why I don't have sponsors on my show, though. <laughs> I can't figure out why. That's great. Because nobody knew that was a sponsor spot I was doing. It, it could have gone with 50 things. The uh, Let me see where I'm at here. Oh, those financial products you use every day at your brick and mortar bake, Roger. Nowhere near best in class. Over 92% of the products available online, all ranked head to head at magnifymoney.com. Whether it's checking accounts, savings accounts, consolidation loans, CD rates, and more, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. And today we're going to help Andrew magnify his money. Say hi, Andrew. Hello, Joe, OG, and crew. My parents purchased a 65 Life Northwestern Life Insurance policy for me when I was born that now has a net accumulated value of around $5,200 and a total death benefit of around $22,000. Now, I don't plan on dying anytime soon. I'm about to climb the rung of life up to 36 years young. And even if I did, I would hope the $1 million term life insurance policy for my wife and I each have and another 150 k life insurance benefit through my employer would cover the necessities. I don't know if this helps. We have around 275k in a mixture of 401k, Roth and traditional IRAs, 403b, my wife's teacher, and her pension. We've been able to contribute around 20k a year to our collective retirement accounts and don't plan to stop. Cool story, right? Get to the question. I'm not convinced that the Northwestern Life Insurance Policy is worth keeping in its current form, given that the past year's accumulated value increase was $263 and the annual premium is 93. I'm considering cashing it out to help pay for home improvements or even putting it into my two kids 529 plans that are performing much better. I suspect cashing it out will be taxed, but that's a pill I'm willing to swallow to make more use of the available funds. Talk me off the ledge if there's something I'm missing, because I really feel like this Northwestern life insurance policy is a drag in our otherwise decent budget retirement planning course, thanks to the advice I've gleaned from your show. No sarcasm, Doug. That comes from the heart. Stay healthy. <laughs> thanks for that question, Andrew. And Roger, why don't we start with you? Is he uh, is he thinking correctly here, or is there some issue that he's not thinking about? First of all, Andrew is very articulate. I want to say very very uh, good representative of your listeners. Are you surprised that the listeners of our show are articulate? Is that what you're saying? Now that you just bashed my sponsor, now you're going to bash my <laughs> listeners. I was complimenting is that what this is? your listener. Oh. I was complimenting you. Oh, okay. I just go to the question. Okay. <laughs> No, I think it's actually a smart idea. I mean, you could, there's some options you could do in terms of maybe using that money to buy, you know, to add to your term policy because it's always cheapest to buy now. And although a million may be good now, think of your future self because that's really who you might be making a decision for. But uh, these type of things do have a tendency to hang around and just be an annoyance for a very long period of time. So go ahead and cash it in. Yeah, I have no issues with that. What do you mean by it's an annoyance for a long period of time? I'm I'm a big fan of simplicity and he's paying $98 a year. It's really not giving him much in terms of death benefit or cash value. It's just one of those things that it's going to become a bigger issue and it's going to, you're just going to have to deal with it. Better just to clean it out. Paula, do you agree? Yes, except one thing I would add is I would check with the policy to see if it can convert into a, a term policy where basically you sort of eat away at the cash value and it turns into a term and it lasts for the next 20 years or 30 years. If that's the case, then basically it's almost the do nothing option where there's no more cash out of pocket. He also doesn't receive any cash. Like essentially it is a do nothing option, but he gets additional term coverage for the life of that. I don't know if that's an option with this particular yeah. policy, but it's worth checking. So this money that he's never had before, use it just to let it go and not have the $93 anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. It'll be no more cash out of pocket. It'll be no cash into pocket. 
the experience will be as if none of it ever happened. But if he were to die during the term in which he is covered as a result of doing that, then, you know, he would have some additional term coverage for that time. OG, what are you thinking? Yeah, I think either of these is fine. The thing that he didn't talk about, which may be a completely separate topic, but the the greater issue or a greater risk, I suppose, for somebody that's young, isn't the fact that they get hit by a bus a sec- and, and die. It's the fact that they get hit by the bus and live. And setting aside for a moment whether a million dollars is enough for term coverage or if it should be a million two or three million, who cares? But I bet that there's probably an opportunity to think a little bit more strategically about the overall protection planning, you know, for the family, not just in the one silo of what happens if I get hit by a bus and die. And what I'm thinking about here is let's make sure that disability coverage is good for both of you in case you can't work because you're sick or hurt for an extended period of time. Maybe you can use that extra money to uh, get your estate plan done. I didn't mention Oh, no, he did mention kids, right? He did. So Yeah, he um, said put them in the 529s. Yeah, so let's make sure that the kids are taken care of and, and you've got a, the right estate plan so you can use this money as a, a kind of a seed capital, so to speak, to kind of knock those things out because nobody's super excited about like wailing on their estate plan at 35. Like, oh, I should make sure that, you know, but it's the same thing about, you know, it's the same thing with life insurance or disability. Nobody really thinks about it. So- so I think you kind of take this thing that mom and dad gave you, probably not a great fit, it sounds like, but maybe use that money for some other protection plan, kind of keep it in that silo, kind of akin to maybe what Paula was saying. You don't benefit or lose anything from it. It still is there, but let's maybe take the cash that's there and, and use it for some other purposes that give you a little bit bigger bang for the buck, so to speak. Or don't do any of those things and you know go to Vegas or... <laughs> Save it for Disney. I mean, there's all sorts of other like more fun options. <laughs> Disney. I know a lot about Disney. I think yeah. that's true. Yes. Dis- you're Disney clearly that Disney, yeah, expert Disney, Disney expert here. Yeah. yeah. I agree with everybody talking about canceling it. The issue with this policy is because it's a whole life policy, it's going to be more expensive than term insurance because of the fact that it's guaranteed to last forever. It will be the company's going to have to pay a death benefit. And if that's the case, they need to cover that. And generally, that's why whole life insurance costs more than term life insurance. Uh, most of the time, the term life insurance is gone bye-bye by the time that you pass away. So the company can make a profit and not have to worry about it paying. But in a whole life policy, that's going to be there forever, which means this is super expensive. So I love what you guys are talking about. Um, unless he thinks he's going to need insurance forever, which is a question to ask. If you think you do, maybe then you do keep it converted. But if not, which is most people, then um, then doing one of those other options, I think, is great. So nice job, team. Uh, thanks, Andrew, for the question. If you've got a question for us, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. And uh, we'll have the crew answer your question like they did Andrew's. All right, that's going to do it for today. Thanks for playing, kids. Once again, Roger, we'll let you, this guest of honor, have the last word here. OG, what do you got going on this weekend, my friend? Oh, uh, we have a whole lot of nothing going on this weekend, actually. Nothing uh, nothing at all. I love those weekends. This is going to be actually the calm before the storm. I think I mentioned last week that my in-laws are coming to town soon. So this is uh, not calling my in-laws a storm. but um, (laughs) Just to be clear. More of a uh, tropical depression. <laughs> not, so, not so much a hurricane or like not a named storm, but but definitely one that you are like, this one could be named. I'm just kidding. Uh, they're great. But the uh, but they're coming next week. So so yeah, nothing really going on this 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 week as we just uh, enough time to barricade the windows, get yeah. the doors all pretend like uh, nobody's home. Like when the, when the people are coming down the street, you don't want to answer the door. It's my new favorite commercial, you know, where the guy's sitting there with, he says, we finally, finally got a nice house and he's even got a spare bedroom, but we've got an ant problem. And then all of his ants are around. <laughs> and one of them's, one of them's like the passive aggressive, <laughs> like it's a big house. Hope you can keep it clean. We love our new home. There's so much space. We have a guest room now, but we have ants. You're slouching again, Ted. Expired. 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 Thanks, Aunt Bonnie. It's a lot of house. I hope you can keep it clean. At least Geico makes bundling our home and car. All right. We will. We will. Geico, if you want to sponsor this show, head to <laughs> Joe at stackybenjamins.com. But that is pretty damn funny. Yeah. Yeah. My favorite. That's, Paul, that's my, that's my mother-in-law. <laughs> Paula, what? Expired. Expired. 
Paula, what's happening at the Afford Anything podcast? On the Afford Anything podcast, we have an interview with Annie Duke, a professional poker player who talks about how to make better decisions. We talk through the decision-making process, decision trees, assessing the range of possible outcomes, determining the probability of any outcome within that range. We talk about all of that on the Afford Anything podcast, which you can download anywhere where finer podcasts are downloadable. Only the finer ones. <laughs> Only the finest. Mr. Whitney, speaking of finest, thanks for hanging out with us today. You bet. You bet. So what's going on at the Retirement Answer Man podcast? Well, this what entire month we're talking about what do you do when your retirement plans get accelerated? And we're actually having a live get together at uh, livewithroger.com later this month, where we're just going to get together and brainstorm what are the risks and the possibilities if your plans have gotten accelerated? So we're talking about that this month. It's a blast. You're not going to talk about what's the interest rate on the immediate annuity now that rates are lower? 1923. <laughs> <laughs> and that's also where finer podcasts are at and also the Rock Retirement Club. Yeah, Rock Retirement Club has been, we just added the new retirement calculator as a benefit for annual members. So we're ramping that up and over 450 people. Talk about networking, walking with the wise, becoming wise. It's a great place to have safe conversations about retirement. That's awesome. We'll link to both at stackybenjamins.com. All right, Doug, you got it from here, my friend. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our roundtable. Don't try to network. Build authentic relationships with people who are interesting and also connected. Second, take a lesson from Elizabeth Dunn. Experiences tend to be happy money, so focus less on things and more on living. But the big takeaway? Joe's mom just said that if I keep talking about networking, she'll stop thinking about allowing me to be her Facebook friend. She can't do that. I made that request three years ago, and she's promised me that any day now, we're in luck. What spirit? Those are the kind of people I want to be around. Hey, hold on, Ma. I'll help dry the dishes. No more networking talk here. Hashtag Doug 2020. A very special thanks to Roger Whitney for joining us today. You can find Roger at rogerwhitney.com or on his podcast, The Retirement Answer Man. Also, a very special thanks to Dr. Liz Dunn for discussing happy money with Joe today. You can find out more about happy money at happymoney.com. We'll also have a link on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Paula Pant appears courtesy of affordanything.com and Afford Anything Podcast. All the Afford Anythings. This show is created by Joe Saul Sehi, produced by Karen Rapine, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I just jumped the shark. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. The people responsible for this show have been sacked. So something big happened in my life this week that uh, 
I, we've been telling friends of the show that we would talk about later, which is that um, we sold our house thinking we were moving to Arizona. And Paula, you came to our house right like just before I was going to move, like a week before I was going to move. Yep. And uh, which sucks because it was so fun hanging out with people there. And it would have been great to have a bonfire in our backyard. But our friend Eric had a very socially distant party there. And we saw Andy Hill had some fun. So I was glad we got to hang out. But that was crazy. But the craziest part for people who don't know my whole story I, we sold our house thinking we were moving to Arizona. And then the job my wife had fell through after we'd already sold our house. Then we became nomads. We'd been in Vermont where we were in Palm Springs, but this week, the good news is actually to draw the story out a little more is that, uh, Cheryl just loves what she does. She works in healthcare, loves what she does, but had enough time that, you know, because we've done good planning to be able to take her time, decide what she really wanted to do. And while she was doing that, she reached out to talk about recruiters. She reached out to a lot of recruiters. We were talking about different places all over the United States. OG, <laughs> I remember conversations, OG, you and I would have where he's like, okay, uh, where is it today? And just realize I'm not writing this down. Like I do, cause every day it was, well, I think it might be moving to Oregon. I think it might be Arizona. I think it might be Florida. It might be, I mean, seriously, we have had all these different places all over the United States that we were going to move. She narrowed it to five. We went to Amish country, Ohio, and she interviewed there. We went to the mountains of North Carolina and she interviewed there. We went to coastal Carolina. She interviewed there. We went to a little town in Southeast Texas, not far from where we used to live. And she interviewed there. And we went to Valdosta, Georgia. She interviewed there. She, she narrowed it to five during the time of COVID. We got on planes. It was crazy. Didn't feel comfortable the whole time. Went to all these different places and the good news is she got offers from all five of those places. So then she was able to choose. So while we were in Vermont, she chose that we were going to go to Valdosta, Georgia, which is pretty damned exciting. And, I, and, and it's funny because I'd never been to Valdosta. Paula, you and I talked about Valdosta before. Mm -hmm. And Paula's like, I, I never thought of that as a nice town. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I have an uncle who lived there for several years. <laughs> it was beautiful. We loved it. But, you know, one person's beauty something else. But anyway, we really liked it. So we were excited about going there. And while we were in Vermont, because we had been all over the United States, while we were in Vermont, Cheryl was walking through the contract with the people in Valdosta, finish up everything, agreed everything, hang up. I'm going to say seven minutes later, because we were in the car on our way out to a hike. Her old practice in Texarkana, Texas called her and said, would you ever think about coming back here? And Cheryl thought about it for two days and we are headed back after all of this stuff. We're headed really? back to the town where we lived for a decade, Texarkana, Texas. Here we come. So that happened wow. this week. That yes. Is, that Wonderful is, that is, in a lot of ways. It's the classic hero's journey. You leave home, <laughs> you go out on your big adventure. And Cheryl's the hero, right? Yes. And then that's you come right. right back to where you started. Was, wow. I was just like, Paula, if we could have cut out the middleman, that would have been awesome. <laughs> we could have just, if we could have started with that, that would have been great. So yeah, they called her and two days she thought back and forth and then called the nice people in Valdosta and said, I apologize, but I'm not coming. Didn't want to waste your time. So if anybody's driving down I-30 and COVID is uh, finally gone, call me. And like we used to back in the day, Roger, you're always driving down I-30. I'm driving on it next week. There we go. We'll have a socially distant lunch, my friend. All right. Live from Joe's mom's basement. It's the Stacky Benjamin show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And we often hear it, but does your network really equal your net worth? Should you look to kick those low net worth chumps to the curb? Our roundtable panel discusses the warrants of the common, common idiom. What the hell is that? <laughs> Uh, oh, discusses so like the, the warrants, nice try, the common Taylor. idiom. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Like the, the warrants, like the merits of that common idiom. Okay. <laughs> oh, it makes sense. If, it if does we're going to be using these fancy words, I'm out. <laughs> Logically makes sense. As does hair to four. <laughs> <laughs> and forthwith. They're on two pertaining. 